start our recording. I'm sorry. So those are not here. I'll have to quickly review. All right. Before I go on to lesson two, I'm going to do a quick review of what we learned. <laughs> uh, because I did not start the recording. Oops. That's my bus. Okay, one second here. Oh, what did I do? All right, so what we learned today, uh, we talked about check constraints, which uh, checks the format of a particular column. Uh, you can you can add certain criteria for constraints, like uh, what Saeed said. You can check to see if there's an at sign, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we talked about defining what a constraint is. It's a set of rules that you can create um, either at the column level or the table level. Uh, we talked about foreign keys and primary keys, how those are generally constraints. Um, that's a constraint just given by that particular indication of that column. Uh, we talked about not null constraints. And remember that not null means that every value of that column has to have a value or every excuse me every column in that in that record or column in, in that um, every record data point in that column has to have a value excuse me all right and then as i said table level constraints i, I illustrated uh, essentially what a, a table level constraint should come at the end of if, of the create table uh, in the columns and then unique constraints and unique key. Unique key uh, is usually a composite constraint, meaning more than one column. And that was our lesson on constraints. And if you have any questions after viewing this, please let me know. And basically, I will uh, go over some of the things that I, I inadvertently miss or didn't record. <laughs> All right. And then... A summary, we define the term constraint as it relates to data integrity. Data integrity is the key here. Uh, you can put place constraints on your tables to make sure that data integrity is high. Um, state when it's possible to define a constraint at the column level and the table level. As I said, state why it's important to give meaningful names. We had, went over this whole naming convention for constraints and a state which data integrity rules are enforced by not null and unique. Uh, write a create table statement, which includes not null and unique constraints at the table and column levels. Remember that if you use the reserved word constraint, you must give, well, it is strongly recommended that you give the constraint a name. If you do not, the system will create a name, but it's hard to recognize what that name, what that constraint or that rule is associated with. And then explain how constraints are created at the time of table creation. Remember to create table, column name, data type and then your constraint at the column level and at the at the column level and at the table level remember that your constraints comes after the definition of the columns all right that was a quick two minute lesson or of the last 40 minutes or 30 minutes all right okay so let's move on to lesson two and this is where we're going to extrapolate in detail primary key, foreign key, and check constraints. I know you all have been waiting for this because it probably generated generated some questions about what, okay, what does the what do these constraints actually mean? All right. So our objectives define and give an example of primary key, foreign key, and check constraint. Explain the purpose of defining primary key, foreign key, and check constraints. Demonstrate the creation of constraints at the column level and table level in a create table statement, uh, which is usually essentially the best way to define your constraints. Evaluate a business problem requiring the addition of a primary key foreign key constraint and write the code to execute the change. Ooh, that sounds like fun, right? All right, so, so as we discussed in the last section, constraints are used to prevent uh, invalid data entry into uh, database tables. It, it It's truly important, it really, is the one thing that will protect you as far as your, your management and manipulation of data. So that's when you can develop rules 
around all these little things that may occur, you can you can protect yourself well by protecting the data. What would happen if surreptitiously or just through a careless mistake, your pers personal unique identif identification was given to another person? Uh oh, now you have a compromise. Now you have a breach or whatever. Actually, this is probably one of the biggest things on the cybersecurity realms that we are concerned about. This whole inadvertent distribution of personal identif unique identification. So, so what if tomorrow at school someone else was credited with your class for graduation or was able to eat lunch using your lunch card number? Oh no, what are you gonna do now? You're gonna, uh, hopefully you won't star. But anyway, ensuring data integrity is what constraints are all about. After all, you're unique. We're all unique, right? We're all uniquely, yeah, all of that unique stuff. So we have to maintain that uniqueness, correct? Correct. All right. Our first and one of the most important constraints is your primary key constraint. So our primary key constraint is a rule that the values in one column or a combination of columns must uniquely identify each row in a table or each record. I like to think of it as, as a record. So it has to be uniquely identified. So no, no primary key value can appear in more than one row in the table. Yeah, that's what the constraint's about. So to satisfy a primary key constraint, both of the following conditions must be true. So no column that is a part of the primary key can contain a null, and a table can have only one primary key. Yeah, that's those are important. One primary key, and it cannot be null. Uh, primary key constraint can be defined at the column or the table level. I remember that. However, if a composite primary key is created, it must be at the table level. So, and remember, a composite is is more than one column. Just think of that. And in some instances, you may need to create a composite primary or a composite constraint or composite primary key. So, when defining primary key columns, it is good practice to use the suffix pk. Yeah, once again, strongly suggest it. So. And make sure you use the naming convention appropriately when, you, when you're when you creating these constraints. I am going to check that, uh, check our whole little naming convention scenario. Uh, so for example, constraint name for, for the primary key column name for the column name client number and table name clients could be, and remember this is could be clients client number. And it seems redundant, but I guarantee you when you look back on that constraint, you know exactly what's associated with. Table, column, and then basically purpose. So in a create table, the column level primary key constraint syntax is this. And we, we've seen this before, constraint, reserve word, client, yeah. And you actually use the term primary key. I remember this clients, client, non PK is just your name. and with the underscores, yes, it should be no spaces. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, but just underscore. And it's typical of a naming convention. So so note the column level simply refers to the area in the create table where the columns are defined. Yeah. So this column is client number and it's a, it is a number of, of size four. And the table level refers to the last line as as we learned before in the statement below the list of individual column names. So this would be, so once again, you can you can declare or create a, a constraint uh, as far as primary key at the column or the table level. And at the table level, you see it's, it's basically the same verbiage, client and then the name, primary key, and then the column, the actual column. You just have to include the column here, um, right? Constraint, client name, purpose, and then column. And notice that the column name is in, is surrounded by parentheses. And you see that there's a second set of parentheses which concludes or closes the the column names. You do need to include that around your your constraint. All right, so. To define a composite primary key, you must define you must define that at the table level, and basically, when you define a composite uh, primary key, 
you identify the two columns and everything is is the same your your naming will get a little bit longer because you want to include both columns see here we have j his which is job history i think or job history id and then so what do we have start date actually this is going to be start date and employee id but we're naming it naming it this copy j his this id start date pk eh, that would confuse me a little bit but since we're only using the employee id and the start date um well let's see why did they do that or they're not they're they're not going to explain so why do you think they named the, oh duh because the table name is copy of the job history so basically remember <laughs> You have to put the table name, so I need to pay attention myself. So the, the table name is a copy of the job history. So table name, ID, employee ID, and then start date, ST date, and then PK. So I had to really use my <laughs> in my knowledge to figure that out, right? And then our composite, our two columns for our, our composite. So just remember that a composite primary key has to be defined or created at the table level. All right, foreign key or referential integrity. Pretty important to understand the relationship uh, and this whole referential integrity between the foreign key and prim primary key. So foreign key constraint <clears throat> are also called referential integrity constraints. Foreign key constraints designate a column or combination of columns as a foreign key the foreign key links back to the primary key. Remember that. The primary key is a unique key, and there's a link. There's a reason why you create a foreign key to create that referential or relational integrity, I, I like to refer to it as. And this link is the basis of the relationship between tables. Oops. So just, just be aware of that. There is a reason why we create uh, foreign keys. So viewing a foreign key, the tape. The table containing the foreign key is called the child table. The table containing the, the reference key is called the parent or the primary key. So see here, department ID, department name, manager ID, location ID, and then a department's table, and then employee table is our child. Department ID is our parent because it has a reference table. Uh, department ID, basically, um, essentially, if we're looking for the department of each employee, you have to create either a subquery or a join uh, from the child to the to the parent table to ensure that you're getting the right departments. All right. And I'm certain we're going to talk about that. See, the department ID is our, uh, the table showing the primary key in departments is related to the foreign key in employees table. So this, so you have that referential integrity. And understanding that relationship here is key because if you're wanting to run a query that will bring the department of an employee or et cetera, you know that there's a referential integrity between these two keys. And this is what I'm explaining, right? We know that King and Kochar and Duhan are all in the same department. They're all executives, so yes. That's a, this is a very good way to understand why you need primary keys and foreign keys. And it is also a way to, to kind of accept the whole concept of creating this relationship. Uh, smaller tables, create, creating a relationship, primary key, foreign key, and essentially having that relationship integrity. Uh, referential integrity constraint rule. So this rule is before you define a referential integrity constraint in the child table, the reference unique or primary key constraint on the parent table must already be defined. And so that makes sense, right? You really can't define uh, a foreign key unless there's a primary key. And I, I can remember there was quite con quite a lot of confusion around that, but a, 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 a foreign key is only there to create that referential integrity for the to the primary key. And creating the parent-child relationship, depending upon how you're viewing the table is a key to understand that relationship. Just just remember that. It's 
don't let it confuse you too much. Don't overthink it. It's really built that way for a specific reason. Uh, so to define a foreign king strain, it's good practice to use the suffix fk as opposed to pk. So that makes sense. So your naming convention should be pretty straightforward. And that's usually the case in these naming conventions. So, um, And the syn syntax for creating that in your creation, create table, as you see here, column level, um, we're creating the department ID and we're just using the copy. So we're using a copy of our table to, to actually add a constraint. Because remember way back last week when we talked about creating these copies, those constraints are not copied. I don't know if you remember that. So, and that was the reason why we were able to manipulate those tables without having to worry about a violation of, of rules. But you can actually create these constraints on your copy table and it, it will definitely um, help, I must say. All right, I'll pause for any, any questions. Is this making sense? I think I, I lost. Who did I lose? Someone dropped out. Are we all still here? <laughs> I never know. I only see myself. So, <laughs> yep, I think we're all here. All right. Yep, thumbs up. All right. Just want to make sure. I don't want you to fall asleep yet. <laughs> all right, let's continue. Um, Horn King Constraints. Uh, this is basically the syntax. You can create a foreign key just like any other constraint at the table level. Remember, you just have to define, uh, create your definition or your naming convention, label it foreign key and your column name. And with a foreign key, and this is the this is one of this is one of the things that's required with the foreign key. You see here, you have to create the and the reference has to be valid. So you actually have to create the reference. So we're creating the foreign key in the child table and creating a reference to the parent table departments and the department ID column. So make sure you're comfortable with this, this uh, syntax because that is very important, very important when you're creating um, foreign keys, okay? All right, so let's talk about deleting. And this is this is the one thing that you ran into as far as one of the violation of, uh, and most of you did do this correctly. If you try to delete, a, if there's a reference, as far as a foreign key, you're trying to change any of that, you will get a referential integrity violation because that's a constraint. So using the on delete cascade option when defining a foreign key enables the dependent roles in a child, child table to be deleted when a row in a parent table. So on the on delete cascade, basically if you want to delete something like department ID or whatever, you would have to you would have to run it this way. So it, it actually deletes um the reference or the references. So once again, deletes, be very careful with deletes. I know on our copy tables you can you can uh test this and um manipulate the tables with this. But if you're on a real database, generally there's probably a constraint on your constraint. <laughs> so if the foreign key does not have an on delete cascade option, reference rows in a parent key cannot be deleted. So, and usually most DBAs will not add that option just, just to keep the constraint in, or the rule in place. So in other words, the child table foreign key constraint includes the on, so it basically uh, del it prevents you from deleting, which, you know, in my days, that's always better than keeping that on delete cascade. Um, so, and I just explained that. Basically, if you have the on delete cascade in place, then then basically you won't run into, um, into violations of constraints or rules. And that's, but you have to be, once again, very careful if you're trying to manipulate data that way. And this is just explaining that if it's not in place, um, so, or how you would generate it um, when you create your table. Oh, let me back up. So if you're trying to create this reference and the undelete cascade is not uh, in place, you will get an integrity violation because it's, I mean, if you think about it, uh, essentially one, one, if the reference isn't there and two, 
if you're trying to create something that's that doesn't have on delete cascade uh just i mean i can go round and round with this just just be very careful with it um and the syntax for it is just on delete cascade and that will protect you at least in the manner that whenever you have some type of deletion it will not create a violation what we ran into before and you won't run into that when you have the on delete cascade and just to sum all this this narrative up uh, basically, this will prevent you from running into into a violation when you're trying to manipulate, remove something from a reference table. And you also have undelete set null. Rather than having the rows in a child table delete it, you can actually set it to null, which I don't know. I've, I've never done this before. I, I just hate setting things to null, but that's the purpose of that. Instead of just deleting it, um, you can pretty much just say, just set it to null and we'll be happy. So this could be useful when the, the parent table value is being changed to a new number, such as converting inventory, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, generally, you would take the time to make sure that all the referential integrity is there. Um, that's more shortcutting the process, and maybe it's not a good idea to do that. All right, so those two are sort of useful. Uh, you'll learn how to use them. There's also the check constraint. So you're all wondering, let's really figure out and find out what this actually means. So the check constraint explicitly defines a condition that must be met. As we said, checks the format, checks the condition. To satisfy the constraint, each rule in the table must make, must make the condition either true or unknown due to a null. Yeah, remember null is not really anything. <laughs> so it becomes unknown. The condition of a check constraint can refer to any column in a specified table, but not to the columns of other tables. So just any column in the table you're dealing with, right? <laughs> um, so here's an example. This check constraint ensures that the value entered for an end date is later than the start date. You see this all the time. So you always say, well, I know it's, it's later. So our check constraint, the syntax is this constraint, give it the name, job history in check, check, and the, you use the keyword check or the reserve word check and basically say end date is greater than start date. Um, so as this check constraint is referencing two columns, it must be defined at table level because it's it's a composite, right? So you're checking the, the end date and the start date, the, which are two columns in our little table here, right? Um, check constraint must only be on the row where the constraint is, yeah, common sense. Check constraint cannot be used in queries that refer to values in other rows. No, no, just a row that you're dealing with. Uh, check constraint cannot contain cannot contain calls to the function sysdate. Yeah, UID, user ID, user, or user reference. So, yeah, can't call those functions. The statement checked sysdate greater than is not allowed. So you can't call sysdate. That's, you have to give a specific date in a constraint. Yeah, so yeah, sysdate is fine, but don't, generally I would not add it to a, a constraint. Uh, just be aware of the conditions. Um, the check constraint cannot use pseudo columns. Um, Curveall, next vault. So any of these, no, you can't use the check constraint on those. Remember, these are, you know, specific functions that are system functions that are that are behind uh, Oracle. So the statement check, yeah, not allowed. A single column can have multiple check constraints that reference the column in, in, and its definition. There's no limit that there's no limit to the number of check constraints that you can use uh, that you can define on a column. Um, so check constraints can be defined at the column level or the table level. And remember table level at the end of your uh, create table statement. The syntax to define a check constraint is column level. So salary number, salary is our column, number eight and two, two, two digits on the right side of the decimal. Constraint employees minimum salary. So it's checking to see that the salary is greater than zero, right? on that salary column, right? And at the table level, same thing. Uh, just essentially, it looks very similar. 
um, we're setting we're setting it. Well, this is our data type, right? But if we set that data type, we can add this table level syntax at the end of the create table, right? I think we got that down. Phew. Okay. So our terminology for this lesson. Um, Basically, our key terms are check constraint, foreign key constraint, references, not null, undelete cascade, undelete set null, primary key constraint. Yeah, if you learn anything from the this lesson, make sure you understand the relationship between primary key, foreign key, again. All right. So in this lesson, you, um, you've learned how to define and give an example of primary key, foreign key, and check constraint. Explain the purpose of those constraints. Demonstrate the creation constraint at the column level and table level in a create table statement. Evaluate business problems requiring the addition of prime. Yeah. Just make sure you're very comfortable with that relationship. I will tell you that can come back to haunt you if you don't really pay attention to that. Any questions? All right. We're moving right along. Oops. Okay. Uh oh, cancel. Cancel. What are we doing? Adobe Reader is going crazy. All right, give me a second here. Let me stop share. One second while I manage my Acrobat Reader. Cancel. All right, here we go. I can do this. All right, going into uh, 14. Nope, that's not what I wanted. All done. Oops. This is what I want. All right, here we go. Just have to give me a second. So managing constraints. Yeah, something you all need to know. All right. So in this lesson, we're going to cover the following list for different functions that the alter statement can perform on constraints. And remember alter is another DDL that will affect the table write an alter table statement to add, drop, disable, or enable constraints. So this is the whole managing constraints after they've been created. Name a business function that will require a DBA to drop, enable, or, or disable constraint, or use the cascade syntax, uh, create a data dictionary for user constraints, and interpret the information return. So would it make any difference if a new student ID number was entered into a school's database with no, no actual student enrolled? Yeah. It is likely that a credit card company would issue the same credit card number to more than one account or that a business would hire an employee for a department that didn't exist. Oh, uh, yeah. See, you have to account for all these, these crazy thought up things, but this is why we need to manage constraints. All right. What do you predict? What do you predict would happen if a business could not trust the reliability? Yeah. So chaos. No one knows what's going on. I mean, yeah, it would not be good to be a part of that business. So a database system needs to be, well, basically you need the rules. And, and But at the same time, preventing, adding, modifying, deleting data that might result in a violation of referential integrity. So yeah, now we're getting into the, the nitty gritty as far as just make sure all the rules are in place and because people will do what people do and humans are, yeah, you know, they just go on tangents, et cetera. So in this section, you will learn how to make changes to your table constraints so that the referential integrity and in turn, the database reliability, reliability are maintained when data needs to be changed. All right, so managing constraints usually occur, I can tell you right now, are by using an alter table statement. Um, and generally it's on existing tables because uh, that makes sense. If you have an existing table, you manage your constraints that way. If you want to create a new table, well, we just learned that. 
So these changes can, can include adding dropping constraints, enabling disabling constraints, and adding a not null constraint to a column. So the guidelines for making these changes are, you can drop, add, drop, enable, disable constraint, but you cannot modify its structure. Yeah, add, drop, enable, or disable. Does that make sense? Meaning you can add one, you can drop it, you enable it, disable it, but you can't change its structure. So yeah, that's, I don't know, kind of defeats the whole purpose, but that's a constraint on managing constraints. You can add a not null constraint to an existing column by using the modify clause of the alter table, and you will see that. Modify is used because not null is a column level change. All right, so you can define a not null constraint only if the table is empty or if the column contains a value for every row. Yeah, yeah, that's, those are, yeah, you probably won't remember all those rules, just basically you, when you receive the the warnings or the error messages, it'll give you a reason why the, the constraint cannot be altered. Uh, so the alter statement requires the name of the table, the name of the constraint, the type of constraint, the name of the column affected by the constraint. So take a look at the example, alter table employees, add constraint, and we give it a name, employee ID, primary key. So we're adding a primary key to our employees tables. Well, wait a minute, what if it already has a primary key? Well, so basically that would be your syntax. All right, so to add a constraint to an existing table, use the following, yeah, we just talked about this. So alter table, table name, add, we're adding a constraint, um, constraint, constraint name, type of constraint, and then the column names. If the constraint is a foreign key, constraint to references key must be included. So if it's a foreign key, you have to have the references. Whenever you're dealing with foreign keys, as far as uh, managing uh, constraints, you always have to reference the, the primary key. So remember that. So do, 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 adding constraints, the primary key, we talked about this, we have our child, yeah. So the following example demonstrates the syntax to add this foreign key to the employees table. So if we wanted to add the foreign key, alter add, add constraint, employee department, foreign key, foreign key, department ID, et cetera. So we're adding this foreign key and we're adding it as an on delete cascade, which is, we're referencing the department ID in the department table, which is the parent table, et cetera. So just, it's very similar um, as far as the syntax to a create table. If you're just alter, altering the table to add a constraint, All right? If the constraint is a not null constraint, the alter table statement uses modify in place of add. So not null, remember that, not null, you have to use modify. Not null constraints can be added only if the table is empty, as I said this before, or if the column contains a value for every row. And the syntax is alter table, your table name, modify your column name, constraint, your constraint name, not null. So we're adding this constraint of not null to that column, right? Okay, and we're using the email column here as an example. So, okay, that's fine, but why enable and disable constraints? Well, to enforce the rules defined by integrity constraints, the constraints should always be enabled. Yeah, that's the whole reason why you created it, right? But in certain situations, however, it is desirable to temporarily, which I hate that word and data, disable the integrity constraints for a table for performance reasons, such as when loading large amounts of data into a table, which I've done this before and yeah, very hesitantly, but sometimes if you're adding 5,000 records and if you're having to you know, deal with a constraint, that could take a long time. So you disable it. So in performing batch oper yeah, batch operation, operations are probably the only time where you want to disable a constraint because it'll make your job a lot easier However, if you're not an attention to detail person and you're not paying attention to how that batch job is running, you may have to redo everything all over again. But that's that would be the one reason to disable the one 
reason that I would recommend for disabling the constraint. Other, otherwise, don't do it because now you're running into why did you create the constraint to begin with? All right, so you can drop a constraint or delete, delete drop. It's not the same. I shouldn't say that, but let's say you want to, you're like, well, I'm going to have to get rid of this constraint. Um, I can tell you right now as a DBA, I would not allow the users to drop constraints because now you're messing with the data. So to drop a constraint, you need to know the name of the constraint. If you do not know it, you can find the constraint name uh, from the user constraint or user cons columns in the data, data your data dictionary is that, that's your informational metadata table um, or schema. The cascade option of the drop clause causes any dependent constraints also be dro to drop. So um, yes, this is another one of those uh, scenarios where you really need to know exactly what you're doing as far as dropping, especially affecting constraints. Um, constraints are designed to maintain integrity and remember that. And if you start changing and dropping and disabling, uh, you could possibly cause some issues. So, so no rules or any data in any of the affected tables are deleted. Just remember, you're just dropping the constraint. So alter table, table name, drop constraint, drop constraint, the name of the constraint, and then cascade, which means that it'll drop any references, et cetera. And that's what we're doing here. Once again, be careful dropping constraints. It's always, um, and then here's that big warning, disabling constraints, yes, I, uh, so by default, it's always enabled. You can disable it. Remember, we discussed this basically only if you're dealing with a batch, a large batch scenario. Other than that, please do not disable your constraints. Um, um, yeah, so you can disable constraints without dropping it or recreating it by using the alter table option disable. Disable allows incoming data where the whether or not it conforms to the, yeah. This function allows data to be added to the child table without having corresponding, yeah. It, yeah, it can create some issues if you're not ca careful. Uh, so disable simply switches off the constraint. Uh, that makes me shiver a little bit because you, you, you really need to know what you're doing when, when you're running this. So you can disable, you can use the disable clause to, to both alter and create in the create table statement. So you see here, uh, <clears throat> create table, copy employees, and we have our columns. Um, and then we can um, disable the primary key constraint. Oh, you should never do that, but yeah, there you go. Or alt to table, disable constraint, and then just the constraint name. Uh, disabling a unique or primary key constraint removes the unique index. Yeah. Danger, danger. We should have one of those flashing signs. Um, using the cascade clause, and this is pretty important. The cascade clause disables dependent. Oh, this is important, but it's another dangerous thing to do. Integrity constraints. If the constraint is later enabled, the dependent constraint are not automatically enabled. So once again, these disabling constraints, uh, just be careful but that's the syntax. Alter, disable. So you disable not only the constraint, you disable any residual or any references. So yikes. So after you disable a constraint, please go back and enable it. <laughs> that would be my recommendation. To activate an integrity constraint currently disabled, you can just run the enable um, on alter and enables the constraint. So it's just alter table, enable constraint and a constraint name. Um, uh, definitely you want to run and enable after a disable and there's some issues with enabling a constraint that I need to point out. If you enable a constraint, that constraint applies to all the data in the table, all the data, data that all the data in the table must fit the constraint. If you enable a unique key or primary constra key constraint, a unique or primary key index is created automatically. Enabling a primary key constraint that was disabled with the cascade option does not enable any foreign keys that are dependent upon the, yeah. Yeah, you can go around and around and around with this. Just be very careful careful with disable and enable. Enable switches the constraint back on after you switch it off. Um, 
Now, speaking of cascade and cascading constraints, uh, referential integrity constraints allow you to <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, define the actions that the database server takes when a user attempts to delete. And remember, just, just keep this in mind. Whenever you're using con cascading constraints, it's affecting the referential integrity. Either you're going to enable it or disable it. Um, if you want to enable a cascading constraint, uh, well, just be very certain you, you have a good idea what's going to happen. So the cascading constraint clause is used along with the drop column clause. Basically, it will drop all the referential integrity, which generally you don't want to do because that removes all the things that you set up to make that relational database a relational database. So it also drops all multi-column constraints to find. So basically using this and not having control of it will undo all your hard work. So just be careful. Um, I would definitely run this on co copy your tables and manipulate the, manipulate them to your heart's uh, content. Be very, well, you can always recreate your tables, but uh, all of this, as far as managing constraints, especially on the drop and the disable and all that, it, you can create a lot of problems. You may think you're making your, your work easier, but um, just remember. Uh, all right, so when is cascade not required? If all columns reference in the, in the constraint defined on drop column, columns are also dropped, then the cascade. So basically, if there's no referential integrity, if you're not dropping keys, primary keys are unique, or or tables that are connected in any way, then yes, cascade. You know, you don't need a cascade. So basically, you can alter table table name, drop your yeah, whatever columns you need to drop. But once again, whenever you're dropping, whatever you're disabling, be very cognizant of what's happening to your data integrity. Yeah. All right. Phew. So after you made it through all that and you enabled everything that was disabled and recovered everything that you messed up. Yeah, I've been there, so <laughs> don't worry if that happens. So after creating a table, you can con confirm its existence by issuing a describe command, as you know. And the only constraint that you can verify using descri describe is not null, as you saw in your describe. The not null constraint will also appear in the data dictionary as a check constraint. Okay. So you can actually check that. So you'll see something like this. So if you want to view all constraints that's associated with your table, you can query the user constraint table. Um, so this is just a select statement on the user constraint where table name is. So this is a copy. So it'll show you all of this, all of this constraint in the constraint type. You have primary key and foreign key here and that they're enabled or disabled. That's another key. So you can see that in this little query here from this uh, select query on the, on the um, user constraint table. Uh, so the constraint types listed, yeah, primary key, check, unique, foreign key, or reference. Reference is a foreign key, so yeah. R and P is primary key, C is check, and U is unique. Phew. So my suggestion, you'll learn about all of this. Once again, you build a constraint for a specific reason. So stick with that reason and don't just leave it alone. All right. So our key terms, alter table, cascade, cascade constraint, disable constraint, drop column, drop column, drop, drop constraint, enable constraint. All right. So in this lesson, we listed four different functions that the alter statement can perform on constraints, excuse me. We wrote an alter table statement to add, drop, disable, and enable constraints. We, na we named the business function that we require DB DBA to drop, enable, yeah. And usually, if you're not a DBA, database administrator, I mean, you probably restrict it from doing most of this, so. And then we queried the data dictionary for the user constraints, which is useful. You get useful information there. All right. There you go. So I'm going to stop this here. I'm going to go into our module 14 or section 14. Take a look at what's required before next Monday. And remember, um, basically, you just have the assignment due for uh, 
13. So, oops, share. All right. Oh, wait. Let me go in here and make sure I'm in my modules view. Yes. Oops. All right. Do, do, do. Okay. Zoom. Share. Browser. Sure. All right. So these are our lectures. Make sure you go through, once again, there's some information about constraints and some examples, uh, syntax. Uh, just review that. I talked about that. You just get you'll get a another good idea on you know the creation of creation and management of constraints. All right, that's our informational page, constraints, and in our demo page, plenty of examples creating constraints. Um, you know, creating tables, creating constraints on the tables. A lot in here to review. Um, I always like to think you can copy and paste these right into your the SQL developer. Um, and definitely it's useful practice. All right, so please remember to do that. All right, and then our practice, as usual, we have our our objectives and then our vocabulary and then our try it, solve it. Nice and practice. And we have three three sections of those to match what we what our lecture was about today. Um, constraints, primary key, foreign key, and check constraints. All right. Uh, and then three talks about uh, managing constraints, right? Or objectives, vocabulary, try and solve it. Um, always good practice. And I definitely will not, will, should I suggest not dismissing <laughs> these practices because we're, we're winding down to the end of semester and there's this final exam that you have to, to tend, uh, deal with. And remember you do have the solutions to all the practice. So yeah. And I'm, I'm, thinking that you're all doing pretty well because you're all doing pretty well in assignments that, you know, you're actually going through these practices. So keep up the good work. Yay. All right. And then finally, we have our practice activity or our assignment for this week, which, you know, it's just like the practice. We have the objectives and then basically you're going to write the syntax following the instructions, yeah, that doesn't seem too bad, right? And that's the assignment. And then, yes, you guessed it. We have a quiz this week, yeah, 20 points. Um, you are allowed two attempts. And it covers creating tables using data, data types, modifying a table. Um, and basically I combine or when, the person that created the quiz combined the last two, section 13 and 14, into one quiz. That's why it's a little more, a little more involved. So creating, using, modifying tables, constraints, primary key, foreign key, and check constraints, and then managing constraints. So, so don't panic. It's not that bad. I mean, you didn't have a quiz last week just so we can make it so tough on you this week. That, no, but you'll be fine. And... Yes, this is due and wow, that says eleven fifty, but if you're a little late, I won't I won't uh deduct any points. And that's it for this week. Then we go into week number eleven. Wait, yeah. Or is this week eleven? Week twelve. All right. That's it. Any concerns, questions, comments? Constraints aren't too bad. Just make sure you understand their usage. It's just a set of rules that you're setting on those tables to ensure that your the integrity of your data is intact. Right? Right. All right. Any questions, comments? You're all good? You're all going to finish the Section 13 assignment by midnight tonight? Yes. All right. That's 
all I have then. I will see you all next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Please enjoy your week and don't eat all that Halloween candy. It's probably all gone by now. <laughs> you can send some to me. I don't have any candy left. So, <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Good night.